Hi, Dr. Dewi. Hi, Dr. Michael. How are you? Fine. Hi, Dr. Dino. Fine, thank you. I hope you're well too. Fine, Dr. Dino. Thank you very much. And hi, welcome to Eyes on Southeast Asia, the premier podcast on foreign policy, security, and economic issues in Southeast Asia, brought to you by Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, the largest foreign policy group in the country. And before we start, I just want to say I'm wearing my zero, sorry, 50 to zero uh, T-shirt uh, because we are launching a climate campaign to get the Indonesian government to reduce emission by 50% in the next 10 years and to reach net zero emission by 2050. Today, we're going to have a great discussion on the recent political events in Myanmar where uh, we saw a military takeover on February 1st. Joining me today are Michael Vatikiotis and Dewi Fortuna Anwar. Michael Vatikiotis uh, is a director of Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, which is based in Geneva, but he lives in Singapore. He's also the author of Blood and Silk, Power and Conflict in Modern Southeast Asia. Professor Dewi Fortuna Anwar is a co-founder of the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, also a research professor at the Indonesian Institute of Sciences. And most importantly, uh, she also served as the foreign policy advisor to the vice president. And uh, uh, both uh, Dewi and, and Michael, uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. And uh, let me start with the first question. Uh, Myanmar has seen many military coup before in 1958, 1962, and 1988. How is the recent February 1st military takeover different than the previous coup? Yeah. Dr. Dewi? Yeah, um, it's true that the military in Myanmar has this habit of taking over power. There are similarities and there are differences. Uh, the coup d'etat in the earlier period, uh, the, it was, you know, there was a first experiment of parliamentary democracy, which full civilian uh, control of the government uh, at the time. And, uh, and of course, then the military overturned that and uh, carried out full military uh, uh, hunter uh, throughout the 1960s until, you know, until the uh, 2000. Now, if you look at what happened recently, there's already a shared power between the military and uh, civilian government. So in the, in the previous coups, the milit there was you know, this uh, liberal democracy in, in, in Myanmar where the military was supposed to serve as a professional uh, military. And, uh, but because of what they saw as civilian incompetence, uh, because of regional rebellions and so on, the military took over power. But unlike in Indonesia, they did not really have this quasi-constitutional uh, exercise of power. They really just serve directly, you know, without, without uh, including the, the civilians. While after the uh, transition to democracy uh, since 2010, and then, you know, with the elections in 2015, uh, supposedly a civilian government, but there is an element of as if, you know, the military also serve within, within that uh, system. And the military is guaranteed a shared uh, of power. And now they are uh, disband dismantling that, you know, again, sidelining uh, the civilians. But now the civilian is much more emboldened. Uh, the civil society is much stronger than in the previous era. Yeah, Michael, how is uh, to, uh, this, uh, this month uh, coup, uh, sorry, last month coup uh, different than the previous ones? Well, I think in addition to what uh, Dewey just explained, I would just say the main difference, I think, because a coup is a coup. Uh, it's when the military takes over and, and displaces the civilian government. But the main difference, of course, has been the response and not just the, the extreme response in terms of outrage and anger on the streets of all, of all the major cities uh, in the country in Myanmar, but also the way that response has been transmitted to the world through social media platforms, through steam, streaming on phones, um, despite you know, internet blackouts in the evening. I think that's the major difference because it is a coup, the response to which is, is very much more visible to the world. And I think that's the major difference. Mm. Well, what do we know about General Min Aung Hlaing? Uh the head of the Myanmar military, the Tadma Dao, you know, what, what kind of general is he? Uh, he he's, you know, he's um, 
not a well-known person uh, because mm -hmm. he's not been easy to get to know. Um, there are quite a few senior officers around the region who know him quite well. He's, he's quite well networked with uh, senior generals in the Thai army. Um, he knows you know, people across the region um, in the armies, but the civilian sector doesn't really know him. Um, we do know that he, um, he rose through the ranks and wasn't particularly popular uh, with fellow officers, uh, but was very successful uh, in reaching the leadership level. And we also know that he's very proud of his position um, and you know, was seeking perhaps uh, after his planned retirement this year, the role of presidency, uh, perhaps also to protect him from potential persecution because after the Rohingya expulsion of 2017, of course, the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court has been gunning for uh, prosecutions of those held responsible. Mm, yeah. But uh, he doesn't seem to be getting along with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Is that a safe assumption uh, to, to make? Yeah, I like to add what Michael says, you know, from well, firstly, we don't really know much about him, but from from reports, he, you know, his persuasion is he's very hardline. Of course, he's been around. Uh, uh, he's been uh, commander of the armed forces uh, since, you know, the, uh, the 2010, 2011. So actually, he presided over that uh, semi transition to democracy, uh, mm -hmm. uh, now working in an uneasy partnership uh, with, with Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, but uh, this is this is uh, clearly a tug of war. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's defense of the Tatmadaw in the International mm -hmm. Court of Justice, uh, from what you know, from what I've read, is uh, a two-sided uh, sword for for the military because uh, it gained her great popularity among the rank and files. Although you know she uh, earned the. the criticism from the international community. And that probably uh, is also uh, one of the reasons why, why there is concern that you know, uh, that's the general could be even more sidelined. But he is very much responsible for uh, the uh, attacks against the Rangers, for the you know, hardline approach towards the uh, ethnic minorities. So, so he's not your reform general, despite the fact that he, you know, he decided for the transition to democracy. Yeah, is is there? Uh, I mean, obviously, the, this was a well planned uh, coup because a coup is not something that you do uh, overnight or in a matter of days preparation. Um, is there any way of finding out? You know, when did they begin to to think uh, and and plan to launch this coup? Yeah, um, the story hasn't really been disclosed as yet. I mean, there are various theories. One theory is that it was well planned, uh, as way back as you know, a couple of years, as a contingency, uh, in case you know the things did not go the way the military wanted them to go, that they kind of took it off the shelf, maybe added a few elements, and then implemented. A more likely explanation is that the process of negotiation was going on between Minil Line and uh, his people, and Dong Aung San Suu Kyi and her people. The negotiations did not go well. Uh, in fact, they broke down. Uh, and at that point, uh, it was decided for the army to step in. Um, so I, there must have been elements of a plan because of course there was a, a pretty well uh, organized uh, takeover, uh, not so much in terms of military units, but in terms of the people who were put in place to run the government. That implies that they were pre-selected. Um, but clearly, the, and I happen to know that the negotiations did not go well, they broke down and the army felt, and Minol Line felt he had no choice. Mm. Dr. Dewi, is, is the Tadmadao, uh, the Myanmar army, as solid as they seem to be? Uh, or is there factionalism uh, within the army? Well, at least I'm not, you know, really, uh, I'm not really as well informed about this. But if you remember uh, some times ago, there was actually a purge uh, within the Tadmadao. Uh, some a senior general was sidelined. And we hear quite a lot about, you know, frequent. Uh, purges of, of, of elements uh, within within the military uh, when uh, some some you know I remember a, num a number of uh, uh, generals or officers that I knew ended up you know were in jail during that, that early transition uh, and recently uh, of course you know there is this desire to present a unified uh, front by the, 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 you know, but there's some an interesting article in the diplomat. Uh, recently, uh, that one of the reasons why why the military push for this uh, coup d'état is this 
fear that a lot of the Tatmadaw families actually voted for the NLD. That is why this, this overwhelming victory of the NLD, you know, 83% is, is, is quite huge. And, and one of the reasons is that, you know, uh, the military sees itself as a symbol of nationalism and national unity and, 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 and tried to demonize Aung San Suu Kyi. But Aung San Suu Kyi's spirited defense of the military, you know, as you know, Aung San Suu Kyi was the daughter of General Aung San, but he's, she's been discredited, discredited by the military because of her, her family is British, you know, uh, so she's not really eligible to become president. But her spirited defense of the military over the Rohingya uh, killings and expulsion, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, actually earned her a lot of uh, kudos with the wider uh, uh, Tatmadaw and, 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 you know, and, and during the election, there is a possibility that a lot of Tatmadaw's families and, and also the military in Myanmar are allowed to vote and uh, many of them probably voted for Aung San Suu Kyi and that, that's the, uh, one of the reasons that you know, they want to uh, prevent further uh, polarizations uh, within, within the military. But I think Michael probably knows the inside. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't think anyone really knows quite what's what's going on uh, within the ranks of the Tatmadaw, which which doesn't exactly is not exactly a very transparent organization. But what we do know is that, um, as as Dewey said, uh, a couple of you know before the um, last elections, um, and in fact way back after the two thousand uh, ahead of the two thousand and fifteen elections, there was unhappiness within the ranks over certain generals who were seen as perhaps too politically savvy, um, you know, perhaps having ambitions of their own who were purged using their political party base as a reason for the purge. Secondly, I think it's important to note that there is some evidence um, of some sort of low level defections going on, certainly from the police, possibly also from the army in certain ethnic areas. I, I mean, you know, as we saw in Hong Kong with the Hong Kong police, you know, the people on the front lines of the security forces are being photographed, their families are being pressured. Um, you know, it's a different ball game from what it was used to be. You're no longer anonymous. Um, and there's a lot of pressure that can be brought to bear on you by your families, by your friends, you know, if you're on the front lines shooting into the crowd. So, uh, Ma Michael, you, you live in Indonesia for many years uh, and, and, you know, the evolution of the military's political role in Indonesia and has a lot of uh, similarities with uh, Myanmar. Uh, do you think there's any chance that uh, Tatmadaw uh, one day, like the Indonesian military, will leave uh, uh, politics uh, and become a professional army? Is that too much to ask? Is, is that uh, such a far away uh, uh, aspiration. Yeah. Well, let me give two parts to that answer. I'll, I'll, first of all, you know, there is, of course, the official narrative is that there are, the army is on is adhering to a seven-step roadmap. Uh, the seventh step of which would be that the army and the civilians share power, um, you know, equally in a, in a disciplined democracy, whatever that means. Um, but the second part of the question is really a story that I'd like to tell. About uh, several years ago, I was in Napidor attending a conference and my good friend, General Agus Vujoyo uh, was also at that conference. And he and I over some years have discussed this issue. And of course, you know, under President Yudhoyono, um, there was an attempt to deploy some of characters like General Agus Vujoyo to talk to the Tatmadaw about the possibility of reform and some of the key reformers from the Indonesian military. And we were in Napidor and we went to visit the uh, army Museum, the Tatmadaw's Army Museum in Napador, which is of course quite a large place and is, is, is singularly subjective in the image that it tries to project. And, you know, I remember General Agus just kept shaking his head and he just kept saying to me, you know, there is just no chance that this army is going to reform. There is just no indication. Um, there is no evidence. There's no proof. There's no interest really in the same kind of reform process that the Indonesian military went through. And I'll just finally say that I think it's always important to remember in the reformasi period of Indonesia, uh, and Agus is very fond of saying this, that when the civilian protesters took to the streets and when you know, ministers in Suharto's cabinet started rebelling against Suharto and in committing a final act of treachery, the army had in fact already started reforming itself. They'd already distanced themselves 
uh, from Suharto. And so in many ways, it was army reform that came first and then democracy. Uh, Dr. Dewi, uh, why do you think the military wants to always uh, have a foot, one foot in politics, the Myanmar policy, uh, uh, Tatmadaw? Uh, is it because they fear if uh, they give out power completely, uh, then there might be a tri tribunal somewhere down, down the line where uh, things may not end up happily for them, as has happened in other countries? Yeah. Well, we can, I mean, that could be, you know, one argument that we could uh, level at them. Uh, but firstly, I would like to add to what Michael is saying that in Indonesia, the in military, the re civil military relations has been much more complicated. And Indonesia doesn't have a history of actual direct military interventions. So Indonesian military intervention, the Dewey Fungsi, started with from Nasution middle way. And it's always been done through more a constitutional uh, you know, approach because there's a loophole in the original under Dasar Patlima, you know, the original 1945 constitutions, that talks about functional groups. So, they, you know, that is the, the back door that the military used. The military was a functional group. So that, how, that was how it was justified, you know, uh, that there was this uh, dual function of the military. While in Myanmar, it was direct interventions, you know, this military coup d'etat, a military hunter. So uh, it's a much longer, uh, you know, uh, reform if it were ever to take place. Uh, you know, so so the, the military in Myanmar is more like the military in, in Latin America. It is still possible, but it's a, a long way uh, to go. Uh, secondly, why does the military feel that it has to hold on to power? Uh, for, for Myanmar, their justification has always been that because Myanmar is very uh, diverse, very fractured, there are endless regional rebellions, conflicts, and so on. Uh, they saw the civilian leadership to be divided, corrupt, incompetent. You know, that was the argument that they used uh, in the 1950s and uh, early 60s. And that, again, will be the argument that they use uh, now uh, to justify, you know, the, the, the rise and the trap for them. They are the symbol of national unity. Uh, they, they are the one that is, you know, despite the factionism of the military, that they are the one that has the esprit de corps, you know, the, 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 the ability to manage the country uh, together uh, and also to modernize uh, the, the country uh, in terms of uh, not just political development, but also economic development, because the military has also been very much involved in, in the, of course, in the economy in Myanmar. So while we can argue that, you know, they're afraid to move away from power uh, for fear of persecution, to them, it is more like a noblesse oblige, you know, this is the, 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 the Praetorian uh, uh, state that they, are, they see themselves as the, the legitimate guardian of, of the state. I'd just add to that, if I may, you know, that mm. to further to what Dewey said about functional groups, I think it's probably fair to say in reference to what I said earlier about the seventh step roadmap, that what they're essentially aiming for in the seventh step is where Indonesia was in the 1960s with the army as a functional group alongside the civilians. It yeah. means that the transition to democracy in Myanmar is not Indonesia 1998, 1999, no. but it's mm -hmm. Indonesia 1965, basically. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, to add to that, uh, I think one thing that is most remarkable uh, evolution about the Indonesian military is that uh, nowadays, whenever you talk politics in front of Indonesian uh, generals or officers, they would just turn their back uh, on you. Uh, they, they're totally not interested. Uh, they have no appetite to join uh, any political processes and they want to be a professional military. So, so the change of mindset uh, is, is really quite, uh, quite remarkable uh, for me to see, right? Yeah, go ahead. I'm disappointed with the state of Indonesian democracy. Yes, yes. Okay, that's another subject. <laughs> Sorry, Dino. I mean, we should not uh, beat our chest too much. Indonesian uh, state of Indonesian democracy and the role of the military uh, re recently retired and you know and so on has also been quite remarkable. Uh, most scholars of Indonesia will say that the Indonesian military is not totally depoliticized yet. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Well, there, there's a, a whole uh, a whole lot of session on 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 that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, look uh, back to Myanmar. Uh, you know the fact that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi now is under detention uh, reveals much about uh, the total deterioration of uh, relations between Aung San Suu Kyi and, and the military. Uh, how do you think 
the, their relationship has changed, you know, since she joined uh, the government in 2012. Because uh, there were some moments where uh, she seemed uh, a bit comfortable uh, with uh, her relationships with the Taj Mahal. Yeah. Anyone? Um, yeah, I mean, it's fair to say that one of the major causes, uh, underlying problems of why we're where we are today um, is because the state of civil military relations was very, very bad, particularly since 2015, when Dong Sao Suu was, Kyi was, was, was elected uh, in, in that first election, free election in 2015. And I think it's also fair to say that both sides are to blame. Um, Aung San Suu Kyi's style of leadership, uh, her attitude, particularly towards Ming Online, with whom she did not have a functioning relationship and has not seen for the last two years, at least, uh, has not met for the last two years, at least, um, contributed a great deal to the sense of frustration uh, on the part of the army leadership, that they weren't getting a hearing, that they didn't actually have a relationship with her. Uh, and so the, the, the gulf between the civil and military wings of government was just growing wider and wider. I mean, there are underlying causes for that, of course, but I think a primary cause was the lack of chemistry between the two leaders, between Ming Online, General Ming Online, and uh, Dong San Suu Kyi. And maybe we can add also, you know, uh, in uh, the earlier period during the first uh, house arrest of Aung San Suu Kyi, she was seen to be very much a victim. You know, the lady, she got the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, the international darling. In way. Mm -hmm. But after Ro Rohingya uh, tragedy, and, 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 and Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, inaction, the government of uh, the NLD was in act, uh, very much defensive and inactive. And, and um, you know, in fact, defending, uh, the, defending the military uh, action. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi lost a lot of credibility in the international community. So uh, in fact, in fact that, is, that is a problem now. So on the one hand, the international community, of course, condemns the coup d'etat uh, and asks for the military to release all of the political leaders. But at the same time, you know, the uh, international community's attitude towards Aung San Suu Kyi is much more uh, mixed, I would say. You know, uh, she's no longer seen as this uh, lady with a halo on her head. Yes, and, and she didn't prove to be the, the impeccable politician that uh, people thought uh, she was, I, I guess, also. And, and you know, I, I find it interesting that the NLD, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, party, uh, did better uh, in the elections last year uh, compared to the previous ones. But the, the USDP, the Union Solidarity and Development Party, uh, which is the Tad Madao's uh, preferred party, did, did very bad in last elections. Why did the USDP did so bad, you think, in, in the recent elections? Well, the army is not popular. And... Um... The, the reason why the USDP did a little bit better in the 2015 election was, if you like, a hangover effect of the Tain Sein government, which was in a way military-led, but a hybrid government. And they did pretty well on the policy front, and they introduced a lot of the economic reforms um, that, you know, that powered the initial years of a transition, where suddenly, you know, Myanmar people were, the people of Myanmar were, were able to afford SIM cards, able to afford cars, um, you know, all the sort of benefits of, a, of an opening. Um, and that was down to President Tain Sein, who himself was from the military and most of his cabinet was, was military too. Um, so in the 2015 election, there was a bit of a hangover effect. But by the time you got to 2020 and the military has committed, continued to commit uh, human rights abuses, uh, continued to treat the ethnic regions very poorly. Um, there was the, the business in Rakhine state, not just with the Rohingya, but with the Rakhine. Um, and so by that time, the military has just become so much more unpopular again. And Dong said she, she's leadership, um, you know, had been proven. Um, and even though her style of rule may have been problematic, there was no doubt there was very little, there was enhanced popularity for her uh, as a leader. Mm, okay. uh, Dr. Dewi, President Biden has announced that the United States was imposing new uh, limited sanctions on Myanmar, uh, focusing more on personalities and, and companies. Yeah. Uh, how effective have sanctions been for Myanmar? Well, in the past, uh, it was not terribly effective because Myanmar chose to isolate itself. You know, since Nguyen took over power, Myanmar uh, 
basically become you know uh, very very inward looking and it chose not to engage with the uh, you know the, the outside world so sanctions against Myanmar was not terribly effective Myanmar then had close relations uh, with China but now uh, in the past decade the um, economy in Myanmar is flourishing and the military is directly engaged in business so they have a lot uh, of stakes in in the economy so uh, I would say that you know uh, sanctioning imposing a wholesale sanction on Myanmar would hurt the people the most because the military would be able you know to cushion itself against in fact the sanctions but if you target the military's business interests they might actually hurt them Michael well it's you know sanctions are generally ineffective um, they hurt the people more than they do the elites and the leaders um, and in the case of, of Myanmar, of course, the army can rely on an, an extensive underground economy, um, whether it's jade, whether it's illicit narcotics, um, whether it's cross-border trade that's not counted as formal trade. Um, there's a tremendous amount of income that they earn from um, um, sort of un, in, informal and underground economic activities running into the billions of dollars. And so sanctions that hit the formal aspects of the economy are really only going to hurt the people and not the Tatmadaw. Who do you think uh, should take the lead on Myanmar uh, from the international community? Uh, the United States, uh, the European Union, or ASEAN? Anyway, you go first on that. Well, I believe that ASEAN should take the lead here. And within ASEAN, Indonesia should take the lead. Uh, you know, this is, this is because Myanmar is part of the ASEAN family. And if the uh, political crisis in Myanmar uh, goes on for a longer period, this is going to cause uh, internal problems within, within ASEAN. It undermines ASEAN unity, and of course it undermines ASEAN centrality. So uh, ASEAN should take uh, the lead, should be proactive, uh, should not allow itself to be marginalized you know, by, by, other, uh, by outside actors. And within ASEAN, and I think Michael uh, would uh, agree with me here that Indonesia, uh, is the one that is best placed uh, to do that. Um, Michael has talked about Ibu Retno's shuttle diplomacy, uh, which follows, you know, earlier prime minister's uh, diplomacy uh, in Indonesia. And also because the similarity of Indonesian and Myanmar's history, uh, you know, the, the, the history of constitutional democracy and military interventions and, and uh, the, the, the difficult path uh, to reform, although it's not apple to apple, uh, the Indonesian military uh, has much more to share, you know, the, with uh, with uh, Myanmar uh, military. And also, I think the fact that the civilians in Indonesia also understand that uh, there is no zero sum game in civil military relations. Uh, you know, there is a need to engage and need to be, to talk even to the bad guys. And uh, and I think that Indonesia uh, has some some proven experience on this. Yeah, uh, but, but before I get Michael to respond, uh, I, I want to comment on that. Isn't the situation a bit different now, Dr. Dewi, in the sense that, say, 10 years ago, uh, when we had uh, President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, he was a general, and uh, Myanmar uh, Tatmadaw generals, uh, 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 Tan Shui and, and so on, would look up to him because he's a former general. Uh, but but now you know uh, it's it's a, a different set of actors uh, now. Uh, do you think the leadership, especially the army leadership in Myanmar, still see Indonesia as a role model and and with the same degree of uh, you know uh, uh, a feeling that they had uh, uh, before, the same degree of respect that uh, they had before, uh, say about ten uh, ten years ago. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, that uh, mm. in fact, Indonesia's democratic regression <laughs> in the fact that, you know, one, one of the criticisms against the Jokowi government, you know, a fully, a full-fledged civilian leaders, the, the child of Remofmasi here, and there are more senior military officers, retired generals in the Jokowi government than under the SBY cabinet. These examples, bad, in terms of Indonesia's democratic credential, probably, but showing to Myanmar that you know having civil leaders not the end of the world for for military interests. So so mm. yeah, I think this, you know, even in this case, not best practices, but probably you know our bad practices could also uh, be used uh, to tell Myanmar you know that 
There are there's still some some rooms for uh, protecting military interests, even in a fully uh, democratic government. Yeah, Michael, I'll go back to the earlier question: uh, the U.S., EU, or ASEAN who take the lead should take the lead. Well, I very much agree with Dewi that you know it's it's ASEAN and it's also Indonesia in ASEAN. Um, you know, I I was I first came to Indonesia in 1987, and I was I, I was privy to a lot of the discussions that had around the time when Pak Mokdak Kusumat Madra and later Ali Alatas launched the shuttle diplomacy over Cambodia. Um, later on, of course, Pak Hassan Wiriuda launched shuttle diplomacy to bring peace to southern Philippines, um, and then Pak Mati used shuttle diplomacy in three areas, really, in the South China Sea, in, in the Rohingya crisis, and also rather unsuccessfully between Thailand and Cambodia. And so it's part of a, what Iberetno has been doing is very much part of a, a long tradition of Indonesian activism in foreign policy that leads within ASEAN. And it's not always easy. Um, it's particularly difficult for uh, Thailand, for instance, to stomach the notion that Indonesia is leading on this issue when Myanmar is Thailand's neighbor and Thailand is a major country within ASEAN, although it's lost a great deal of its regional capacity over the last decade. And so it's not going to be easy for Indonesia, but continue they must. And it's very much part of a strong and successful tradition of Indonesia uh, leading uh, the regional organization, not just because it's the biggest country. I think as Dewi indi indicated, it's, it's more complicated than that. It's a long history of activism. It's the fact that uh, Indonesia's foreign policy tends to be more idealistic, democratic or otherwise, than some of the neighboring countries, which more or less look after their interests. And you'd say that foreign policy is always about interests, but Indonesia's interests are so rooted in the revolutionary struggle for independence and how it achieved it, that I think that activism continues and carries through. And as Dewi said, with Myanmar, there is a special place. Myanmar was able to help uh, Indonesia in, in the revolutionary struggle, and there's still that hutang budi, if you like, a little bit. Um, so I think that, that for all those reasons, Indonesia is in the lead. Now, of course, the downside of all this, you know, is that ASEAN still burdened by the, 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 the heavy um, presence of states who will not tolerate uh, interference in their neighbors. They stick very strongly to the non-interference principle. And we're seeing how now ASEAN is divided on this issue, very much more so than ever before, where Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei perhaps, Singapore are very much in favor of a more proactive stance on, on Myanmar, but the mainland countries of Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos um, are very much stand, you know, standing back and not wanting to interfere. And so yes, ASEAN in the lead, and I think the US and China are behind that, which is very interesting. It's a geopolitical impact that is a dividend in a way that both China and the US are on the same page in pushing uh, ASEAN to be in front. Um, you have the EU and, and uh, other European and the UK, for instance, wanting to be more active, considering establishing envoys. And of course, you know, you have the UN uh, not playing much of a role either um, in the current circumstances. So yes, ASEAN in the lead with support from the major powers. Well, let, let me bring you to the statement by uh, ASEAN foreign ministers meeting that met virtually on 2nd of March. Uh, the statement stress the need for political stability in any ASEAN country, calling for a refrain uh, from violence and calling for a peaceful solution through constructive dialogue and uh, also express ASEAN's readiness to assist Myanmar in a positive, peaceful and constructive manner. Doesn't mention about democracy, doesn't mention about elections, uh, doesn't uh, mention uh, about the military coup and the fact that you know it's not a good idea. It, it wasn't. It, it wasn't a good thing to do, and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, what is your take on this? Uh, there's only one paragraph on Myanmar, actually two. The other one was uh, a smaller reference. Uh, but but what is your take on this? It seemed like a painful paragraph. Uh, uh, regarding Myanmar's political development? I, I actually think it's a bit unfair on the meeting because what actually happened in the meeting was that half the countries in ASEAN refused to say anything at all until the, the, the subject of Myanmar came up, which is very significant because they weren't playing along with the notion that this was just a meeting about general issues and Myanmar would be one topic. I think it's fair to say that uh, certainly Indonesia, uh, Malaysia and Singapore, uh, also the Philippines, basically only spoke at the meeting about Myanmar. 
and, and in that respect, I think strong messages were sent. The chairman's statement was not necessarily a fair reflection of the candor of that meeting, but nonetheless, it put a face on that meeting that satisfied the other half of ASEAN that was not in favor of making strong statements and sending a strong message to Myanmar. So it was a compromise. Yeah, Dr. Dewey? Yeah, uh, just following on, on, on Yakel, this is the typical ASEAN, you know, if there is a short sentence that says, you know, after long discussion, ASEAN agrees on this, it means that there's a long discussion of disagreement. And, and this is really papering uh, over it. And, and here again, you know, uh, the how do we go forward? Uh, I think we have to admit the fact that we have to bring ASEAN into this. Uh, ASEAN should, wherever possible, be the one that try to uh, uh, host meeting. But uh, following what happened on Cambodia, if you remember, you know, it, it, took, it, 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 it was only later on that ASEAN uh, come on board. It was Indonesia that started with uh, Pak Mutar's cocktail parties and then Pak uh, uh, sorry, uh, and then Pak Alatas then came with a Jakarta informal meeting. And it was only after that happened that uh, Indone Indonesia was uh, formally appointed by ASEAN as an interlocutor uh, for ASEAN on Cambodia. So if it is not possible for ASEAN 9 here, or ASEAN, clearly not ASEAN 10, to come to a consensus on how to go ahead on Myanmar, uh, I think here I would fully agree and support Indonesia and, and other fellow ASEAN countries, uh, you know, to, to find uh, a modality, an informal meeting, take turns hosting informal meetings in Jakarta or in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Singapore, you know, uh, and, and other countries that are, uh, are willing uh, to do that and, and, and host informal meetings uh, to talk to, uh, which are inclusive in nature. So, you know, uh, at the moment, the supporters of NLD uh, angry with Indonesia and angry also with ASEAN, uh, which which are willing, you know, to talk to the military because they think that the military should simply be isolated and 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 and, and just be forced be forced to stand over power. Uh, but here in this case, it's you not know, that if we want to have a peaceful political resolutions, we need to be able to, uh, to bring all the parties together. I would add to that that you know, in addition to what Dewi is proposing, which I think is beginning to happen, I think it's clear that the four countries, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and Brunei are going to be very active and they're gonna move ahead together and separately, quite actively. Um, I think in addition to that, it's very important that ASEAN starts to break the mold in terms of tolerating, encouraging, supporting, endorsing civil society action and dialogue. And this is something that's always been very difficult, difficult in ASEAN. There's no respect for civil society. There's no place given to civil society, apart from the symbolic ways in which they do it at every summit and so on. And so I think it's really important to mobilize track two mechanisms, the ASEAN ISIS network, CSIS Jakarta has been very active on this issue. Um, also looking perhaps at mobilizing um, the ASEAN parliamentarians who have their own grouping, um, who want to be very active in advocating and engaging with the protest movement. And similarly with some of the human rights organizations, this is something the time has come. You know, where ASEAN can no longer just do it at the official level. There has to be a more nuanced approach to engagement. And of course, you know, it's all very well for Ibu Retno to say that I'm engaging with the CRPH, but actually it could be done more effectively by civil society uh, with a much broader, in a much broader and inclusive way, because it's not just CRPH that's in the protest movement. I want, I want to bring back uh, to the earlier point uh, raised by Dr. Dewi that uh, we, we saw some protests from Myanmar, uh, which actually uh, regarding what they saw as ASEAN or, and in, including Indonesia going along with the plan by the Tatmadaw to hold elections in one year. Uh, so there seems to be strong resistance on the ground about that pathway. Do, do you think that ASEAN should continue to go down that route uh, uh, as, as the way forward, which is to uh, count on uh, a new elections organized by the Tatmadaw, uh, or at least backed by them, uh, to deliver uh, the next political round for uh, Myanmar? I think it has to be clarified, uh, Dino, because Indonesia and ASEAN never said that, you know, that uh, they will accept that. 
but it was it was leaked uh, uh, in the Reuters uh, uh, news uh, by Indonesian officials talking about that. Yes. Yeah, yeah but I think it says you know it's not it's not the uh, it's not the uh, formal authoritative position of Indonesia or, or yeah. ASEAN. So I think that the uh, the default uh, uh, position of Indonesia would be you know to try firstly to stop uh, the escalating violence there. Uh, to uh, call for restraint, and then to bring all the parties, uh, you know, into a, a negotiating table, which means, of, of course, that those leaders who are uh, under house arrest or in jail must be released, because otherwise, how will they be able to take part in this in this dialogue? And then, thirdly, you know, to try to find some some uh, compromise positions. And uh, for us, you know, the the uh, November 2020 elections is a legitimate election. This is not accepted by the military, but this is, you know, this is a legitimate election uh, that, has, uh, uh, that must be respected. So I think we should uh, uh, regard that as a default position first. Yeah, but, but we're, we're still going to hit that wall at some point. The, the wall... I don't think we should preempt. The most important thing is to bring all the parties uh, to uh, the, 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 you know, uh, the negotiating table. So I don't think we should preempt, uh, you know, what would be the results. Uh, no. If you say that, you know, oh, we ASEAN will support this or that, uh, that means that we actually preempt what the people in Myanmar actually uh, uh, want uh, to agree upon. Mm. I, I very much agree with Dewey that, okay. let's be clear, the negotiation process, when it takes place between the parties in Myanmar, will be an internal process. It will be internally led and internally facilitated. And of course, all countries would say the same thing. It's our mess. We're going to resolve it. Um, the point being that Myanmar has, is unique at the same time amongst ASEAN countries as being the only country where ASEAN has successfully created mechanisms for dealing with internal matters. And so we saw it started with Cyclone Nargis in 2008 with the creation of a special mechanism for ASEAN to cooperate with the international community in the rescue efforts in Cyclone Nargis. It followed on in 2000, after 2017 with um, the ASEAN Humanitarian Assistance Center um, being invited to conduct a needs assessment on the potential for repatriation of Rohingya refugees. And it then led to a, a completely unprecedented creation of an ad hoc team within the Secretariat um, with a mandate from the Myanmar government to assist in the repatriation process. And uh, this is the only country in ASEAN that has allowed this to happen. So there is a role for ASEAN inside Myanmar, but I suspect as Indonesia has pointed um, in some of the statements that Ibu Retno has made, that it's going to be more in the, in the area of humanitarian access, the, policy, the possibility of distributing vaccines, a sort of a support function in terms of relief for the country, but the, the negotiation process and how they resolve the conflict will be internally driven. But that's not to say the country won't need help. I mean, I've been told, for instance, right now, that no one is measuring how many people have COVID. No one is taking data and statistics about the extent to which COVID-19 is prevalent in Myanmar. The public health system has completely broken down. There is going to be a need um, for ASEAN to help afterwards. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that everybody is worried about is the potential bloodshed in uh, Myanmar. And things are getting more tense now. Uh, the uh, pressures uh, on the ground are really felt, and there's been some shootings uh, resulting in some death uh, in in Myanmar. Uh, how serious uh, do you think uh, uh, this is? Uh, will it get worse? And can can do we expect uh, uh, worsening uh, conditions in terms of violence? Yes. Um... My understanding is that from the army's point of view, their strategy is to continue to ramp up and increase the pressure on the protesters using um, increasing levels of lethal force and force and lethal force um, in the hope that this will gradually um, reduce the numbers of people in the street, um, tire out, exhaust, shock, um, intimidate, um, the protesters themselves, so that eventually a, a semblance of normality is restored and they can proceed with their plans. Um, it's a vain hope 
uh, so far because these tactics don't appear to be working. Although yesterday was the first day without fatalities. Uh, today, it looks like it's also fairly quiet. Um, and it could be that's because there's a UN Security Council meeting going on so that they've held back a bit from that strategy of using lethal force. But to consider that on Wednesday, almost 40 people were killed is a very, mm. very strong indication that more and more violence is likely. Mm. Uh, Dr. Dewi, Myanmar's uh, political uh, developments always involve uh, concerns over ethnic rebellions. Right? What, what is the update on that? Uh, and is there, a, is there a concern that Aung San Suu Kyi government has not been entirely successful uh, in dealing with these uh, ethnic uh, rebellions? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the ethnic rebellions have been ongoing. Uh, but I think that what we have to say here is that, you know, the civilian government under Aung San Suu Kyi had very little control yeah. over the military uh, operations in the, in the regions. So uh, if you look at the division of power, you know, uh, uh, the uh, defense force, the uh, home ministry, and the, the ones who are in charge of uh, dealing with the regions are fully in the, in the, uh, you know, in the hands of the military. So uh, the military is hard line on this. Although there was there's some, some attempts at negotiations uh, in fact, here they also learn from Indonesia. Uh, we have hosted, you know, in Indonesia, uh, the Institute for Peace and uh, uh, Democracy of the Bali Democracy Forum, for example, actually hosted a meeting uh, in Bali at one at one point uh, when uh, several uh, military officers who are involved in dealing with the uh, regional uh, uh, rebellions uh, came to Indonesia to learn about uh, how we resolve the situations in Aceh. Uh, so there are attempts uh, there, but um, unfortunately, uh, the, the default drive, you know, the default mode of the military tends to be, you know, uh, harsh measures over, over dialogue. Yeah, I, I remember when I accompanied uh, President SBY, uh, when he was talk he went to Myanmar and he talked to uh, the leadership there. Uh, the, the ones that got their imagination or attention the most is when we... Uh, express our sympathies uh, uh, with uh, the uh, the efforts to preserve uh, national unity on on Myanmar because that's the same problem that we have uh, in Indonesia. But but that angle seemed to uh, capture the attention most than than uh, on on democracy and and other issues. Yeah, uh, Mike, you want you want to comment on the ethnic rebellion part? Uh, is, is there a chance that some of the ethnic groups uh, are feeling sidelined even after the military coup uh, that occurred recently? Well, I think actually there's also the possibility of a more optimistic outlook. Um, we should remember that in the elections that happened in November last year, um, the ethnic parties didn't do completely badly. Um, the ethnic political parties, the Shan National League for Development, in fact, the SNLD, ended up getting the second highest number of votes in the country. Uh, even, you know, obviously the USDP did very badly. Um, and, and so the ethnic parties may actually now be in a better position. Um, they may have more leverage. Um, just before the coup, and after the election, the NLD had in a rather clumsy way reached out to the ethnic parties and said, okay, let's talk about power sharing. But it was badly done. Um, you know, the ethnic parties were not happy with the NLD. And in fact, um, you know, were it not for the coup, we probably would be talking about the severe problems that the elect civilian elected government is having with the ethnic parties because they've been unable to agree on power sharing. And it goes back to the 2015 election where Aung San Suu Kyi refused to allow ethnic parties to actually run the states in which they had a majority of votes. So in Rakhine State, where the ethnic parties won a majority, uh, the NLD um, was appointed as chief minister. And, and that was in fact what triggered the violent conflict in Rakhine State. And similarly in, in other states, they were very unhappy with the NLD. So in many ways, a reset, if that's possible, not so much of the election itself, but of the political, um, uh, topography would actually help give the ethnic parties more of a say, and that's ultimately good in terms of their aim, which is a federal system. If, if I can add here, there's also an mm. element of um, uh, you know communal issues here. Uh, I think uh, Dino and, and Michael, because the uh, NLD is basically Burman, basically Buddhist, and as we see in in the Rakhine state, you know the Aung San Suu Kyi 
was very, uh, the policy of the of the, the, the central government is very much backed by radical Buddhist monks. And while um, most of the uh, uh, ethnic, ethnic minorities, it's not just minority in terms of ethnicity, but also in religions, like uh, there are most, a lot of them are Christians. So here, uh, ironically, the military sometimes, you know, is seen to be a more of a national unifying force because, because it's not just Burmans and, 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 and Buddhists. Uh, while, you know, NLB tends to be much more Burman and, and Buddhist. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's less capable also of engaging uh, with ethnic minority. Yeah, it comes back to the oh. next issue of the election, you know, because as you say, as you said earlier, you know, you know, there's a lot of resistance to redoing the election because of course the legitimacy of the NLD. But in fact, if there was to be a new system of proportional representation uh, in fresh elections, um, undoubtedly the ethnic parties would do even better. Um, the NLD will probably still win. Um, and, you know, it might create a sort of a more proportionally um, uh, uh, equal, uh, not completely equal, but more proportionally equal uh, electoral map. I think at the end of the day, what the ethnic groups are looking for is, is of course, uh, moving towards this goal of a, of a federal system. Um, and for that, it's not just about ceasefires with the military and working out uh, arrangements for uh, demobilization, disarmament. It's also about political arrangements. And I think it's very important that, uh, that the ethnic parties are given more of a say in whatever comes next. Thank you. So we've come to the end of our talk. Uh, I have one final question. It is often said that China and India are the most influential external players in Myanmar. Uh, how, how true is that? And, and can you explain the dynamics of India's and China's influence in Myanmar? Yeah. Michael first and then Dr. Dewi. Okay, um, India has been surprisingly quiet. Um, India's under a lot of pressure now from the US uh, and Japan and, and, and uh, its allies in the quad, so to speak, but also European powers to say more and be more proactive. But for India, the problem is that, you know, relationships with the Tatmadaw were quite good. Um, security cooperation along the long border between India and Myanmar has been good. Um, they have quite a bit of investment riding uh, inside of, particularly in Rakhine state. Uh, strategic investment. And so India has been very quiet. Um, China has also been quiet. The advantage that, China, that India has is that no one in Myanmar has the perception that India is backing the Tatmadaw, whereas the perception in Myanmar amongst many, many people is that the Chinese are great supporters of the Tatmadaw. I think that's not really particularly true. Certainly the Tatmadaw doesn't like the Chinese, don't like the Chinese. Um, I do think though, that it's more likely that China will step in at some stage um, possibly quietly, possibly by sending a senior official down to Naypyidaw, banging the table as they have in the past and as they have in other countries and insisting that things are done a certain way, but we haven't got to that stage yet. Dr. Dewey? Yeah, uh, there is this, you know, India is the world's largest democracy and one can, one, you know, one expects that India uh, will act more uh, in support of democratic forces in, in Myanmar but uh, this is not the case, even during the earlier uh, period of democratic transitions, uh, when ASEAN and Indonesia were uh, uh, trying to engage Myanmar, uh, to assist Myanmar in this democratic transition, India was not interested. And I remember at one Shangri-La dialogue where probably you were also there, Dr. Dino, when you know, I posed a question to the Indian uh, minister, defense minister, that, and his answer was very interesting because he said, India is not in the business of exporting democracy. Uh, so, so that so maybe they're not they're not uh, engaged here in terms of economic engagements. I'm not really sure. I'm not up to date. Historically, of course, you know Myanmar was part of the British colony run from India. So relations with India is a bit problematic also because uh, you know the Nguyen actually uh, expelled uh, the Indian uh, uh, ethnic uh, in Myanmar at the, at the time. So, but now you know in the modern time. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent India is really an important economic player yet. China is the most important economic player in, in uh, Myanmar, particularly in the northern uh, area, the most important investor. So uh, Myanmar, of course, is very nationalistic. The Tatmido is very nationalistic. They don't like the Chinese. But the fact of the matter is during the period when Myanmar is under sanction, it was the support from the Chinese that actually 
help to float uh, the uh, Myanmar's economy besides all of those illegal uh, or you know underground uh, economic activities uh, with, with, with Thailand. So now uh, China is a very important player. And for, for us, it is the most important thing is there's a concern that the geopolitical rivalry between the US and China could actually be played out also in, in Myanmar, you know, where uh, Myanmar could support one side, the Tatmi Do, and the US could support, uh, you know, the democratic forces. You know, that is one of the concerns that have been expressed. And clearly, in, uh, ASEAN does not want this. You know, uh, it is important that, uh, as has been mentioned earlier, uh, by, by Marco that China and the United States are on the same page, uh, give ASEAN, allow ASEAN the lead here and support whatever initiatives that uh, you know, ASEAN uh, is doing. Okay. Well, one final question, uh, you know, Michael, uh, you know, I've known you uh, since when you were a journalist for Far Eastern Economic uh, Review magazine. That was like a long time ago, right? Uh, and uh, so you've seen how the region uh, progress and you've always been uh, an uh, astute uh, analyst, uh, student of, of the region. And, and what happened in Myanmar recently uh, uh, sheds light on the question of non-intervention, right? Uh, which is a, you know, a sacred ASEAN principle, right? Uh, but you know, what, what I wanna know is, uh, have we evolved uh, on how we look at and apply this uh, question of non-interference, uh, you know, times have changed and w w what is the limit of this uh, non-interference? Non because, uh, you know, not everything can be, uh, you know, justified by, by, by non-interference, right? And, and uh, the same question to Dewi after, after Michael, yes. Well, I've always believed that, you know, in a, in a part of the world where nationhood is less than 80 years old, you know, eight decades for the most part, it's still a relatively short time. And so we're always going to see a very strong assertion of sovereignty, um, you know, driving that sort of uh, fear of interference. And of course, the great, the two great experiences of the last 150 years, which was the colonial period and also uh, the invasion of the Japanese Imperial Army, I think makes, you know, this region, you know, very allergic to interference and fearful of outside intervention. Um, and, you know, I think also, you know, 80 years is not a long time for a region to become cohesive and coherent in social and, you know, social terms, let alone economic terms. The countries are still very much the countries unto themselves. Um, but having said that, each time something like this happens, we reach a juncture where increasingly society says, look, um, we can't go on this way. We have values to defend and uphold. Um, we increasingly tend to have common values. Um, most of the countries in one form or another practice a form of pluralistic, semi-democratic government, uh, even if not perfect. Um, and I think citizenry is increasingly saying, look, you know, we, we can't let this happen. And I go back to the point I made at the very beginning, that the difference this time around, it's very hard to cover your eyes and cover your ears from what's happening in Myanmar because of the way that social media this time around has played such an important role. I was in the region in 1988. And I can tell you that I heard and read about what was going on on the streets of Myanmar, but I didn't see what was going on. And you couldn't feel that outrage until the stories trickled out afterwards. And so I think it's important to recognize that now with the way that social media has developed, it's very difficult for governments to ignore um, what their citizens are saying about what they should be doing to address these problems, which I think does put pressure on non-interference and the culture of non-intervention. Yeah, and, and in fact, if ASEAN is truly a family, they, they should actually welcome uh, expressions of concern or ideas or policy inputs, uh, so long as they're, you know, they're given in a good spirit. You know, at least that's my view. Uh, Dr. Dewi. Yeah, uh, just adding on to what uh, Michael and, and you have said, uh, uh, Dr. Dino, uh, actually, ASEAN has moved forward. You know, that, that the, the existence of the ASEAN Charter uh, is very important. Because very, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, the Indonesian Prime Minister, the other uh, Prime Ministers in ASEAN countries and ASEAN itself has been have been able to cite, you know, uh, language from the ASEAN Charter. On paper, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, 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 so when we talk about, you know, yes, true, the, uh, the uh, principle of non-interference is not an ASEAN invention, it is in the UN Charter, 
it is, but that is the basis of international relations after all, you know, because if all countries intervene in each other, so con there'll be continuing conflict. So, uh, you know, the, the, the basic default of international relations is that you do not interfere in the uh, uh, political uh, workings of, uh, of other countries, you know, like in the US, you know, uh, uh, campaign finance, you know, if uh, foreign countries interfering in, in domestic politics is a no-no. You know, so this is this is a, 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 a universal principle, but in ASEAN it has tended to be regarded as a sacrosanct that even uh, gross violations of human rights uh, have tended to be protected behind national borders. But with the ASEAN Charter, that that's changed. It has not gone as far as we would have liked in terms of reforming the uh, political culture in the region. But the fact of the matter is that the ASEAN Charter actually mentions about the importance of democracy, protections of human rights, rule of law, good governance, and that ASEAN leaders who are criticizing Myanmar actually not quoting the UN Charter, but quoting the ASEAN Charter. I think that that's very important. Yes, I agree. And, and you know, I do, I do think that, um, you know, the act of uh, uh, abolishing or abrogating the, the, the election results and arresting the, the winners of, of those elections and then uh, uh, launching uh, acts of suppression uh, and so on. Uh, these, uh, and for them to expect that ASEAN do not say anything, but their, their neighbors don't say anything, I, I think uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to, to, to accept. Uh, if, if anything like that happens uh, in our region and if it happens in Indonesia, uh, you know, I, I would expect our, our neighbors and the international community to 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 speak about it. Uh, so so yes, I, I think uh, yes, intervention is still uh, important concept, but uh, you know there there are, there are limits to it, uh, and and I think uh, you know c countries uh, should speak up whenever there is a serious violation of uh, democracy and and uh, uh, human rights. Yeah, so. But with that, uh, and please, please, yeah. Please. And finally, don't forget, you know, there is internationally, there's this uh, responsibility to protect, yeah? The, princ yes. the principle of responsibility to protect. So we'll be remiss, the international community will be uh, re very remiss if we allow, uh, you know, the violence to continue yes. in Myanmar. Because this is a uh, regional and international concern, it's not just a uh, national concern in Myanmar. Good. Well, Dr. Dewi and Michael, I wish we have another hour, but I want to thank you for your uh, uh, sharing your thoughts uh, with us. I have enjoyed uh, very much, and, and I'm sure our listeners have also learned a lot from your comments.